Hey there, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Dark Parade. Uh, my name is Bo. I am your host for these proceedings. We have put behind us the Listener Request Month. I really appreciate everyone who recommended movies. Uh, there were some we did not get to, but, that, you know, that it'll come around next year. Next February will be dedicated to uh, more listener requests, so uh, start thinking now. But get out your notepads, keep your lists. So we are beginning uh, a couple of months here of, uh, of, of mini-series, uh, uh, in the purest sense of the word, a series of episodes on, on a couple of uh, movie franchises that only have a couple of entries, some uh, standalone movies, that kind of thing. All leading up to a grand celebration in June, but more about that uh, as June approaches. Let us instead focus on the task at hand, which is, of, of course, uh, the movie The Gate. And uh, The Gate 2 will be next week. I'm joined by Mike Merriman, who uh, surprisingly hasn't been on the show yet, and uh, I'm glad to correct that problem. Uh, but we had a really good conversation about the gate and, and sort of how that movie sits in a weird place in history where I don't know that you could make a movie like the gate today. Certainly not as, as vicious as the gate tends to be at times, but I won't spoil that. Yeah. You'll hear all about that in, uh, in the conversation ahead. Um, just a big thanks to everyone listening. We've got more bonus stuff coming pretty soon. And as always kick back, enjoy yourself. And welcome to the Dark Parade. Here's me and Mike. All right, everyone. As we have, uh, I have threatened you uh, in the upfront. I am joined by Mike Merriman of uh, No More Room in Hell, and and uh, let's be. First of all, thanks for being here, Mike. Well, you're very welcome. I, I know uh, you've been uh, friendly enough to put out the uh, the offer. I mean, not to me individually, but just to, you know, a bunch of us in general. And uh, sometimes it comes down to a lot of timing. Like, did sure. I see that message in time? Because I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised I was the first one to respond to this one. But uh, as it may uh, be, I was. So uh, congrats to me. And I'm here and ready to talk about this movie. All right, before we get into that, you and I are similar in that we both, <laughs> we were talking about this off the air, but we are both uh, apparently living our lives like somebody has dared us to do as many podcasts as possible. And so when I say you're from No, no More Room in Hell, but that's like saying, you know, like that is an umbrella name for a bunch of stuff. And <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, if you're asking for the rundown, well, uh, yeah, No More Room in Hell is like the main, that's where it, it kind of started, at, at least this new kind of, the new era, I guess. Because, um, you know, back in the day, it was Evil Episodes, the horror TV one, um, did that. I think that's still technically the longest running one I did. Mm -hmm. But um, that kind of went away just because of my lack of time to keep up on TV, which is kind of funny because I almost feel like we're having another renaissance of horror TV now just through, you know, streaming services more so than networks. So it's kind of ironic in that way. But uh, yeah, so No More Room in Hell, it, it, I would call it like you're, it's probably a very familiar format to everyone, you know, a couple of movies that we just want to talk about just because we want to throw in some news, some, any hot topics going around in the genre, you know, your basic stuff. That's me, Venom, and Derek. And uh, Fresh Cuts is kind of the, uh, I guess, sister companion show to that. That's a weekly one where we just cover whatever new release is out. Um, we, we tend to favor theatrical when possible, but obviously there's not a theatrical release every week. So uh, we'll find something on a service um and then venom actually started a side cast off that that they were gracious enough i mean they brought it to me and said can we put it under the no more room in hell banner and i said sure and that's their creature comforts mm -hmm. I've, uh, I've been on podcast. that show yeah yeah man I, i've listened to most of the episodes it's a really fun show too and yeah. uh yeah i'm sure i'll eventually end up on there <laughs> sometime 
but uh, yeah, it's it's fun, you know, doing all the shows. Luckily, I you know I'm probably at the limit of what I can regularly do, but uh, I tend to like guest spots more than doing my own shows now because I I feel like there's nothing like watching a movie, showing up, talking, and then you're done, and then I never have to think about it again until it's actually out and I can listen back. But uh, none of the uh, off the call or after the call work when you're a guest. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that's how I feel too. Whenever someone asks me to guess on their show, I'm like, yeah, of course I will. That, that requires almost no effort on my part. I love that. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but you were kind enough to do this and it's weird that this is out of, you know, out of the 20 shows we've done at this point, it's weird that this is the first time you were on it. Certainly not the last. Um, but well, we'll see how it goes, I guess. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was about to say, yeah, let, let's, uh, we got, <laughs> we got a movie to discuss before we figure that out. <laughs> so we're talking about the gate. We're doing the gate one and two to kick off, uh, our, our March series. And I always like to ask this up front. This is a little thing I stole from Duncan because, uh, occasionally he has good ideas. And I don't like to cop to that too much. <laughs> but um, how, when did you run across the gate? What was the, what was your first experience with this movie? Well, um, just scanning the IMDb, it looks like it came out in '87, and I'm and I'll say I I was too young to have seen it in a theater, but I probably saw it shortly thereafter when it hit like the VHS uh, market, and you know when it started showing on TV. My my earliest actual memory of watching it was uh we had where i grew up we had a local like one of the local rock station djs had a uh, like a horror a weekly horror host hosted show i guess almost in the vein of like a joe bob or elvira um it was called fright night theater and uh you know local i guess we we would consider ourselves a mid-sized city so you know they're not always gonna they're not they're not licensing like nightmare on elm street the original or the, the big stuff so uh the gate you know it must have been in their budget because they showed this one often and so i was pretty young but in retrospect i mean we'll get into it i'm sure once we start talking about the movie i think i was at the perfect age for a movie like this so yeah I, and it's something i grew up with saw it multiple times as a kid and uh i think that's a big aspect of why i like it so much and you know as we discuss it uh, i'm sure by the end you know at the end it's I, I think it's an interesting question like who who now would i recommend it to because i like for people in our that are in our peer group that have never seen it would they have the same experience i don't know but for people that saw it as a kid and maybe grew up with it i, I think the kind of hits the nostalgia feels but uh much more on that later yeah yeah i i think you're right though it's interesting because at, right who do you recommend this movie to now but We'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'm probably in the same boat. I saw it. I feel like this is a movie that hit HBO real hard. Mm -hmm. And that's probably where I saw it. Or at the very least, I know I had it on VHS. And watched the shit out of it when I was a kid. Because I would have been 14 when this movie came out and so seeing oh, okay. this around the age of like 15 16 it was like i was just on the upper end of where this movie would have been just right you know um like i i feel like if i'd been 12 that would have been the perfect age i was a little older than that but i do remember even seeing it at the time like i was really fascinated by the creature effects that that's really what caught my attention but as i've gotten older and especially watching it for this conversation the thing that i kept coming back to was how weird a movie it is for a for being pg-13 which is crazy when you think about it and mm -hmm. it's also like it's got a a, a, a some fulci moves to it where it's just like, so what's happening again? Oh, okay. There's just this dead dog in the bed. Fair enough. All right, the gate. Let's yeah. do this. 
I feel like it. There's moments in this movie that it feels like a real legitimate like movie that's trying to be scary, and it manages to do it. Like, if we throw out the rating, because I know when people list off a rating, it automatically might put a stigma in their head about you know the content and all that. But if mm-hmm. if you just forget about the rating for a second, I feel like it really tries to be a scary horror movie and tonally like you know once stuff gets going because we'll get into that but um yeah between the creature effects and just like as the stories unfold i'm like you know they they really went from making a legitimate horror movie here but they managed to do it too like there is like a little bit of blood and stuff but they managed to do it without really ever having to get too graphic to have to like even edit it for tv other than you know when they cut down scenes for timing but I, I think that's what kind of because that, that's what surprised me a little bit in this watch i was like i i, th- I thought i would have forgotten more from it just because it's been a while but i'm like no that's pretty much the movie i remember seeing like they didn't have to cut much out for tv it's it's all there so, or it was all there i mean yeah yeah there there's one scene i'll we'll get to on the back end of this that that almost cost them that pg-13 but um, mm-hmm. so it was directed by a guy named tibor Takas, I think, is how you pronounce his name. Uh, T-A-K-A-C-A-S is known for this. uh, Directed I, Madman uh, (laughs) in the 80s uh, is is probably... I mean, it's still working. Like, he is still directing movies, but it looks to me like he has fallen into that Hallmark slash Lifetime uh, pit where in his old age he's directing stuff like Rocky Mountain Christmas and a Christmas Miracle and the Christmas Ant. Um, <sighs> yeah, well, yeah. Uh, I was I was gonna say my wife would be happy to probably check out his filmography then. <laughs> yeah, right. I, look, I ain't above it. There's uh, some of that uh, Hallmark and Lifetime stuff. Uh, like I, I like the trashy ones. I'm not as much for the Christmas stuff. But you give me like a good, you know, stalked by my doctor kind of movie, and I'm on board for it. <laughs> oh yeah i mean any and especially like the, like i haven't really kept up with them in recent years but i remember like in the 90s there was like some really just it seemed like so many of them had to do with like a jilted lover or like a barely legal like uh, uh what, i'm trying to think not not a lolita but like uh what was the uh uh the italian the, the teenage girl that oh right 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 dated, the uh Lorraine, long island uh, lolita uh what was, was it amy fisher amy fisher that's it oh, I, I kept fisher. Going like, a, like a bunch of yeah uh, no i was yeah i was just gonna say there was like a lot of that kind of stuff yeah and it was just like sometimes I, I would wonder like like does lifetime realize like how, they're not obviously they weren't graphic because you know commercial network tv but i'm like they were still sleazy as hell and i'm like this mm-hmm. lifetime monitor this <laughs> like wow I, I, look i will tell you right now the uh I, I think it was lifetime pretty sure it was lifetime that did the adaptations of all the vc andrews books those mm. movies are great and by great i mean terrible but i love them it's it's yeah, they're I, trash I, but oh it's just the kind of trash that i can really sink my teeth into yeah i i feel like our what was it i think it's i think it's hulu either hulu or prime they just put out a movie earlier this year called the voyeurs and uh it stars sydney sweeney who I, she's probably best known for either uh euphoria on hbr or white or white lotus is on hbo too i think and uh i mean that's straight lifetime movie it's just they got a lot more graphic because it's on Hulu. Mm-hmm. But I mean, there's no way you can get 20 minutes into that movie without thinking, you know, if they cut out like the nudity in this, it would straight up be something that would air on Lifetime. Oh, that's great. Um, all right. So this was in addition to our good friend Tibor, uh, who directed this as well as uh, a number of Hallmark Christmas movies. Um, it was written by a guy named Michael Nankin who is probably best known for this in terms of his writing output. Uh, But he also wrote one of my favorite made-for-TV movies. Maybe it wasn't made-for-TV. Maybe maybe this did go theaters. A movie called Midnight Madness. 
uh, starring David Naughton of uh, American Werewolf fame, Michael J. Fox before he was famous, Stephen First is in it, Eddie Deason is in it. I mean, it is a laundry list of early 80s. I think it came out in 1980, as a matter of fact. Um, and anyway, terrific, like, early 80s, late 70s movie, if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, he has since gone on to be, like, an EP on that Van Helsing TV show, was a, a EP executive producer on The Exorcist TV show, uh, does a lot of TV work, uh, doesn't really write so much anymore, does a lot of directing, does a lot of producing. Uh, most recently directed a couple of episodes of that Chapel Wait show um, over on Epics, I think is where that thing landed, with uh, Adrian Brody uh, that was based on Jerusalem's Lot, the Stephen King story. Keep meaning to, to check that out and just haven't gotten around to it yet. But anyway, so guy's still absolutely working. You could make the argument, and you would probably be right, that he has sur surpassed Tibor, uh, his directing partner, <laughs> yes. uh, on on the gate. But yeah, so this this movie came out in '87. Um, <laughs> was was not hiding the way that uh, the Gate Two uh, would would hide from audiences in a couple of years. Oh. But we'll get to that next time, ladies and jelly spoons. Don't even worry about it. Um, Sheesh. Yeah. But so the, the movie kicks off in a dream sequence where a young Steven Dorff, uh, who is, as far as the actors go, he's probably, not just probably, he is absolutely the biggest name. Um, and he's very young. Uh, in in this film, um, he was he was about my age. He was uh, about fourteen years old when this uh, this came out, but he was always, you know, kind of baby faced uh, to some degree. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and that, that tells you that tells you something right off the bat that uh, when the fourteen year old actor in your movie is probably the best actor. <laughs> Right. Well, yeah, I mean, the movie is kind of on his shoulders, you know, there, there's mm -hmm. him, there's Lewis Tripp, the, the guy who plays uh, his friend Terry, who is, mm -hmm. again, probably best known for this and The Gate 2, where he takes over the starring role. And uh, Krista Denton, who plays his, uh, Stephen Dorff's sister in this movie, uh, her name is Al, um, she basically was an actor for four or five years did a number of parts like this. And then not long after this movie came out, she just kind of disappeared when, went on with her life. Apparently 1990, she just stopped acting. Um, yeah, it's always, it's always kind of interesting when you get those cases where, you know, young child actor or actress in nothing. Well, as far as we know, well, unless you're going to drop some tidbits on me later, but as far as, uh, you know, doesn't seem like it was a bad experience it just wasn't the career they necessarily cared for so maybe they just by happenstance landed some roles starred in movies and was like all right now to get to the next part of my life yeah yeah i mean it, she quit acting when she turned 18 um so yeah i mean she was kind of a kid actor and then probably went off to college and you know god only knows she's probably a professor of something uh, but yeah, she, you know, did a lot of TV work. She was in growing pains and, uh, believe it or not, there was a new leave it to beaver that she was in, <laughs> but, um, yeah. And, but this was, is kind of her biggest movie, unless you count the burning bed where she was, she was playing a, I think a younger version of Farrah Fawcett's character in that movie. But, um, yeah, anyway, so we, we start with Steven Dorff, uh, who is, having a dream about coming home the house is empty uh there a storm kind of blows in uh sort of out of nowhere um there's a weird music video happening on the television where a dude is pulling his eyes out and uh then he he is sort of called to his treehouse in the backyard 
and ends up climbing up into the treehouse, which is subsequently hit by lightning. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that and it's just it, you know according to the uh, director and writer commentary I listened to, this was a scene that was later added. This didn't exist in the original script. Um, and it was added later just to set the tone for the movie of like, this is going to be kind of weird and atmospheric and, and sinister, you know, like it's a really, the one thing you could say about the movie, the gate is it's a constant downer. This is not yeah. like a happy movie at all. And the, the opening scene of the movie lets you know that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, once, little events start kicking things off like tone totally wise it's like they're put through the ringer it just like gets worse and worse for them throughout the movie with little you know downtime for recovery <laughs> yeah so after this dream sequence he wakes up uh, and it turns out that their this tree has fallen this tree uh, from his dream um has fallen and there are some workers outside that are uh cutting basically cutting it up and he finds a geode that has uh, been up, up earthed or unearthed uh, a after this tree fell. And there is also spooky smoke coming from this hole left by the tree. And, and so that's how you know some, some heinous stuff is about to go down. Yeah, that no one seems to be alarmed about except him. You know? Right. He gives, it a con he gives it a concerned look, but otherwise, you know, perfectly normal, I guess. You would think that he would ask, like, hey, uh, is this smoke poison or something? Because there's yeah, a lot of it. Yeah, did you hit a line under our yard or something? Right. Did you hit the gas? Did you call the number on the side out front to make sure you weren't drilling into nothing? Uh, but he ends up inviting his friend over, Terry. And they find uh, an even bigger geode. And as part of the demonic stuff that is about to go down we see that Stephen Dorff's character Glenn is uh, the kid's name he gets a, a big splinter stuck in his hand which bleeds into the hole and as they're going back in with their find this big geode they run into Al the sister who is throwing out a bunch of her toys and very some yeah well so, yeah. yeah you know what I, after watching this movie the first time i think i actually uh was interested in launching rockets for like a day or two until i f completely forgot about them <laughs> oh a hundred percent by the end of this movie you're like you know model rockets may be the greatest thing that's ever been invented and i yeah had... i i definitely you know was making out my christmas list at the end of the gate with the rockets do you ever have those water rockets where it's uh, you put a little bit of water in them, and but then you you attach them to an air pump and you pump a bunch of uh, air into it to to kind of force uh, the the rocket in such a state where you hit the release button and it expels all that air out along with the water super fast and propels the <laughs> plastic rocket up. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that I, I can't believe they just sold that to kids. I it's like lawn darts, you know. It's one of those things that I wonder how many fatalities, how many how many lives were cut short by that red rocket propelled by water. Hey, how many careers at NASA did the gate start? That's what I want to know. Man, that, I would love to know that too. I. There would be no greater satisfaction for me than hearing, like, an interview with some NASA scientist being asked how they got their start and say, well, you know, I saw this movie The Gate, and it turns out that rockets can kill demons. Well, maybe not, <laughs> but I really got into rockets after that. Yeah, this uh, memory foam that we developed, I can trace it back to my first viewing of The Gate. Right. <laughs> when I saw a dead dog in bed, and I was like, boy, I bet that dead dog would like to be comfortable. <laughs> and I invented this memory foam that will uh, absolutely form the contours of a dog corpse if you put it on, put yeah. it on top. 
Not only does it insulate the space from burning from burning the astronauts alive, but it makes for a comfortable resting place for your past dog. <laughs> That's right, as opposed to the front seat of some loser's car going through a drive-thru. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, so, but, you know, Al is very symbolically throwing away the, uh, her childhood, right? Like she's becoming more of an adult. She and Glenn are close, but clearly that closeness, closeness is starting to, uh, to wane some as she is getting older. And in fact, he's like, Hey, what are you doing? Throwing out all those cool rockets and stuff. And uh, I'm going to save this from the trash. And she's like, fine, whatever. I'm going to go hang out with my teenage friends. And she mm -hmm. just kind of takes off. Um, and, and so a lot of this movie is sort of... It, it, I mean, it's very much about childhood to one degree or another. And, and also the dynamics of childhood. And this is one of those things. Like, I had a brother that was six years younger than I am. Uh, I still have him, by the way. He still exists. Um, but uh, when we were growing up, like, I remember, you know, him being seven and eight, and I was turning 13, 14. And those times when we would kind of hang out and play together just came to an end. And, yeah. you know, that that's bittersweet, but it's also just the, the nature of things. Yeah, I I have a sister um, who uh, she's also still with us, <laughs> um, just two years younger than me. So obviously not that big of an age gap, but I would say there's something about when the older sibling hits junior high and the other one's still in elementary school where junior high kind of feels like it ages you a few years just because of all the things you discover that you weren't aware of before. And it just feels like all of a sudden, even sixth graders that are only technically a year younger than you, it you're just like, they have no idea. I, I know the world now and they're stuck behind and maybe we'll reconnect next year. But uh, yeah, totally. I mean, I don't, obviously it's not the same as a six year gap, but you totally get what you're saying. Yeah. And, and that's kind of, you know, what's happening in, in this movie between Glenn and Al and uh, Glenn's father by the way, is like, hey, fill, fill in that big-ass hole in the backyard. And uh, so he does, uh, and Terry ends up catching these weird moths, moths that are uh, flitting around near the hole as well. And uh, later that night, there's a great scene where Glenn is telling his dad, because uh, it turns out the parents are about to go out of town. And he's talking to his dad about being kind of frightened. And again, this is very childhood. Like, I'm afraid of the monster under the bed. Only in this case, the monster under the bed is this workman that died building the house and lives in the walls. And the father is like, who told you that? <laughs> and he's like, well, Terry told me. And uh, the father is like, look, I don't want to spill any tea here. But Terry's a little bit of a weirdo. And here's why. And we learned that Terry's mother died. And he's like, look, Terry, he's going through some stuff. And not everything that Terry tells you is necessarily on the up and up. And, but, you know, just understand that when, when he's talking to you. And... So they end up taking off. The Glenn's parents uh, are, are heading out of town for three days. And they're leaving Al, the older sister, in charge for those three days. Uh, and very strictly say, like, hey, don't throw any parties or anything crazy. And she's like, of course not. I'm the good one. And cut to, she, she's throwing a party as soon as they're out of town. Yeah. The, the least surprising next scene is... <laughs> Yeah, and, and so while she's having this party downstairs, Glenn and Terry are up in his bedroom, in Glenn's bedroom, um, listening to heavy metal music and trying to get this geode open. And Terry is kind of telling the the story of this band that's all about like black magic and, and that kind of thing. And all the members of the band died in an airplane accident, except for one who went crazy. 
and uh, they end up getting this geode open. It kind of cracks open, and you know, again, more smoke comes out of the yeah, thing. More, more mysterious smoke. Um, and most interestingly, it also, w- when they pick this geode up, it leaves a bunch of words on the, uh, like the etch a sketch, not an etch a sketch. What are those called? Those little magic tablets where you could just write on them and then pull the the plastic up and it would erase it. You know what I'm talking about? Well, of course you do. You've oh, seen the I know movie. exactly. Yeah, I've I we probably had some of those around the house too when I was a kid. It's, yeah, I, don't, I can't even remember what they're called, but yeah, you just apply pressure to it and it'll keep whatever you did, but then you just pull it up and it erases it. Yeah, kind of a magic tablet kind of thing. And uh, at any rate, yeah, that, yeah, I tell, yeah, I should tell my kids that's what that's what tablets were for us when we were kids. <laughs> right. That that <laughs> that was our computer tablet. You would write a thing <laughs> and then you could just lift up the plastic and erase it. But it always kind of existed on the back of the uh, the tablet itself. Um, but yeah, so yeah, this, this, this magical smoke, uh, printed a page of the Necronomicon apparently. I mean, that's kind of what goes down here. Uh, the, they talk about this in the director's commentary some, but the movie is actually quite Lovecraftian, but it, it came out at a time where that really wasn't a word, Mm. but it very much is because the whole thing deals with like old gods and demons and stuff like that. And well, yeah, I, and I'm I'm actually glad. I mean, obviously now, listening, you heard the commentary. I'm glad because the, something on this watch in particular, uh, you know, as things start unfolding that we're just starting to get into now, it you're I, I'm trying to get a handle on like, well, what exactly, what entity or what is this? Because just weird things that seem to be unrelated happen. Like obviously you know between the tree getting taken down which opens the portal i guess in the yard and i guess the incantation that they're about to say in the scene we're currently on it's like okay we know how things get started but once they start it's like what am i supposed to believe they unleashed and i don't know if the movie's ever 100 percent clear about that itself the love crafting would be a good explanation because you know like you said at the time people didn't think of that term but now when you say that term it it at least gives off the idea that hey there's not necessarily supposed to be a perfect explanation so it makes sense yeah they get more into the whys and wherefores and gate two but it turns out that's not really what you need to know like this movie is so (laughs) much more about just being a kid Mm -hmm. and mm, anyway so they end up going downstairs after uncovering this Necronomicon page that was written by the Geode. And um, there's they're kind of playing that light as a feather, stiff as a board sort of game from the, the craft. Uh, hey, 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 any good high school party is going to feature some levitation, right? Right. They're, well, it starts off with them telling scary stories and stuff, and then they do this levitation trick with Glenn. And sure enough, uh, yeah, they try with the high school friend first and they can't manage to do it. (laughs) Yeah. But it, with Glenn, it works on account of him being, uh, you know, right next door to evil and all. Mm. And he ends up floating into the air and kind of grabbing onto a light fixture. And then he kind of crashes back to earth and breaks this light fixture. And, he starts crying in front of all of his sister's friends and then runs upstairs embarrassed. And again, this, like Michael Nankin, the writer, admittedly was just like, I put all of the worst things that can happen to you in childhood into this movie. <laughs> and and one of them is embarrassing yourself in front of a bunch of teenagers by crying. And which, you know, it turns out the older you get, the more you're like, eh, crying ain't that big a deal. Like, people just cry for all kinds of reasons. But when you're a kid, right. it, it you feel so vulnerable and ashamed and all that stuff. It, like, I, I respect the fact that this movie just puts the screws to Glenn and never lets up. Yeah, and it, it, 
it, you know, until kind of like the end when he does like what he does to remedy the situation. It's just more him running into bad situation after bad situation, trying to barely escape. Uh, and yeah, I, Glenn, I, I think he deserves some crying with everything he's put through in this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and all right, so <laughs> after he runs upstairs that night, Glenn starts to see some weird shit going down in his room. Like there's the bedroom walls start to stretch all Nightmare on Elm Street style. Um, and then Terry uh, hears something downstairs and goes to investigate and has this vision of his mother, you know, saying, I've come back for you, you know, his, his poor dead mother. And he embraces her only to wake up and realize oh no this was not in fact his mother this is glenn's sick dog that is now dead that yeah that's not horrifying at all right <laughs> right i mean again poor glenn man like it you know not only has he bawled in front of his sister's friends and broken this light and he's got to explain that but now the dog died after his parents were like, hey, we got to go out of town. The dog's been kind of sick. Make sure that you give him all his pills and stuff. But sure enough, he fucking dies. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, credit to the gate. That's not the last time we see dead dogs. So thanks a lot. It, right. We get some mileage out of this. And uh, so... The, the next day, Terry comes over, and this is... I was kind of con conflating the two scenes, but this is the point where he brings the the record uh, over that um, is all about the dark book, uh, which, you know, is kind of a substitute for the Necronomicon in this. And mm -hmm. Terry is like, hey, did I tell you about the workmen in your walls? Fuck that. Listen to this shit. I think that that hole in the backyard is a gateway to uh this like evil realm filled with demons and gods and we we kind of accidentally opened it and the only like if we wanted to complete this we would have to throw a sacrifice into this hole yeah and i i love the fact that it's like you know this this demon realm in that hole about 12 feet under your house like it's 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 what about the it's it's deep enough to be like the deep end of a swimming pool maybe that's that's how close the demon realm is to us by the way. well you know that's what you get it's the last place you look uh it's hiding in plain sight and that's also why glenn's dad got such a deal on the house was <laughs> like hey how do you feel uh about a never-ending battle between good and evil in your backyard. Yeah, I, I guess you could almost compare it to like a uh, poltergeist situation because if the house is sitting on top of this demon realm, then once they kind of unlock, you know, the juice, then you know it starts affecting the house too, and that, that, that's something to keep in mind. It's like uh, not everything is centered around just the hole in the backyard other stuff starts happening, which I, I actually want to say, like, I think, you know, some of the later gags that come up are, are some of my favorite. Uh, for sure. And it's kind of the, the other thing I kind of like about all of this is that the kids are like, all right, we're not actually going to throw a sacrifice into this hole. But meanwhile, Al's dipshit friend who was supposed to dispose <laughs> of this dog has thrown the dog into the hole. <laughs> so, sacrifice done. And uh, that night, things really start to pop off around Glenn's house as we see uh, this, you know, flurry of, of moths outside the window that ultimately shatters the window. And when Al comes in to see what's going on, um... Terry hasn't moved from his spot on his memory foam mattress. And so they're mm -hmm. like, Terry, Terry, wake up. And the blankets pulled up real tight. And in a scene I really like, Terry shows up behind him is like, what are you guys doing? And they're like, well, if you're there, then who's 
uh-oh, and they throw back the blanket. Sure enough, uh, the dead dog is under the the blanket where Terry was. And and this is really, like, everything starts to pop off. Like, they see that. Uh, these monster arms come from under the bed to grab Al and try to pull her under it. Um, but Terry and Glenn get her out. Um, this is the, uh, you've been a bad boy moment where they try to just run outside and run into, uh, their parents who are there in the middle of the night, just standing outside waiting for these kids to run out. And Glenn <laughs> rushes into his father's arms and, you know, again, this is just a movie meant to torture Glenn. And he goes from the safety of his father's arms to his father doing the, you know, Glenn, you've been real bad. You've been bad. And starts to choke his son, like all Homer Simpson style. And Glenn ends up punching into this guy's face where it just you know, like goo comes out and whatnot, uh, in, in a real like poltergeist three kind of move. Or like troll two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, this, I guess the lesson is if you're a child, trust no one because every, <laughs> pretty much every, every time he turns to someone or something, they either get taken from him, killed or turn out not to be what he thinks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really dark that, you know, again, you're like you said, just every every icon of safety and and love is just ripped from him, sometimes multiple times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, the, it turns out that, you know, they're demons and whatnot. They run back into the house and... They're about to go, uh, Al volunteers to go check out the backyard and it's like, hey, we'll go see if anything, if anybody's still out there, if anything's afoot. But sure enough, this is where we get our first look at all of the, the minions, these little demons uh, that are yeah. swarming. Demon all dwarves, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And... um let's just for a second let's just talk about how cool this is like they use a lot of a combination of stop motion and forced perspective stuff with guys in rubber suits mm -hmm. and little awkward grunts for audio too yeah but it looks great it, it's the thing when i think about the gate this is what i think of is all of these little <laughs> minion demons yeah it looks I I actually think like the effects and just the practical stuff in this almost looks like a pay grade above what you would have having what you would have expected going like you know twenty minutes into the movie you wouldn't expect that stuff to look that good but it it does I I still think it looks really good even watching it now yeah there <laughs> there's one point where one of the little minions gets his arm uh, stuck in the door as they're trying to close it. And mm -hmm. they end up slamming it shut, and the arm falls, uh, and then turns into a bunch of little swimming sperm-looking things that that scurries back under the door. And it's that mm, kind yeah. of stuff where I'm like, this is just so weird and creative, and you know all the things that the sequel is not. Um, <laughs> but it it like again watching it a couple of times recently. It, I don't know that the movie is made for... In fact, I know the movie is not made for adults. It's very specifically made to traumatize children. But it's just creative enough that even as an adult, I was still wildly entertained by it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that was something I was going to bring up to you. Well, I, I didn't know when would be the good time, but since you just mentioned that, it, it's it's like I, I watch this movie as an adult now, and I'm like, I I still get much enjoyment out of it, but I'm like, is that more having to do with the fact that I saw it when I was a kid and it's always kind of stuck with me? Not that it's a movie like I necessarily think about all the time, but like you said, like the little demon dwarves things, like 
I'll always remember what those look like, you know, until, until my brain betrays me and I can't remember <laughs> things at all anymore. I, if, if you bring up this movie, that image of those things will pop into my head at, at all times. Like it's something, it's something iconic to me that I'll always remember. And I'm like, do I, do I think too highly of this movie because of when I saw it in my life? And like, would I, that's why it's a hard movie now to recommend to my peer group that if they, if they haven't happened to have seen it already. Cause I'm like, I don't know if someone my age would get out of it now what I got out of it as a kid, which is really what, I mean, that's the reason that's probably stuck with me all these years. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I don't think it would land the same way if you've never seen it before. You know, I think if you, if you mm -hmm. see it as an adult, that's just not the intended audience for this movie. But also, I think that if you're if you're a kid between like ten and fourteen, that it would still work. Because even though the the times have changed and the technology's changed and all that kind of thing, um, it, it's hitting on the fundamental fears of being a kid. It's, it's the monster mm -hmm. under the bed. It's the workman buried in the wall that your friend told you about. And, and ultimately, it's about, like, your family being taken away from you. It's about your not being able to count on your friends or your family to help you being all alone. Um, you know, that stuff, I think, still works. It works less if you, if you come to it for the first time as an adult because those just aren't the kinds of... You know, that's not what you worry about, you know, as an adult. But Right. Exactly. And and maybe me having kids, like my oldest is only ten, so it like I can almost kind of like in my in my mind I'm like, Well if I can get her to stop watching Encanto over and over and over, you know, maybe uh, i I can slip in the gate there uh on accident right and then see what she has to say about it. it yeah i would be interested and you know and again this may be just my own bias i do think i i think it's more male oriented like i i think mm -hmm. being a 10 to 14 year old boy specifically makes you a prime target for this movie and i mean target because it is a weapon <laughs> that has like this movie weaponizes childhood anxiety and serves it up to you uh but i yep. think that's what makes it interesting is like even at this scene when he's you know he's been terrorized by fake parents and now is trapped with his sister and his best friend but that is quickly going to go away. Um, yeah. And, and I remember specifically as a kid, um, you know, as the movie's going, um, you know, the parents go away. There's, there's very, you know, specific points in the movie where like, every time I would watch it, I would like hope for a different outcome. Like, first of all, I would be like, don't send all the friends home because safety in numbers. Mm -hmm. Then they all leave. Then I'm like, okay, well, he still has the friend and the sister. And then I think, is it uh, the friend that gets taken first? And then I'm like, he's okay, he still has his sister. And once she gets taken away, it's just like, oh, shit. Like, every time I would get that same anxiety for him, like, just the relatable nature of, like, it slowly gets taken <laughs> from you you know and those are his safety valves in the movie and it's just like i can only imagine like the terror that would happen as like everyone you think you can turn to slowly gets picked off yeah yeah well so they try to reverse this by going to the hole and and reading uh psalm 59 oh i i love the fact that i crack up every time when they have the bible and it's clear that they like you know they might have like a generic religious upbringing but not enough to really know what they're doing and he's like well, i don't know what to read J just read something yeah <laughs> like that cracks me up well and that's the thing is you know again stripping glenn's 
sense of safety is also, hey, we're we're confronted with demonic business, but you can't count on uh, you can't count on religion to help you. And so you end up like Terry falls into this hole ultimately where he is attacked by these minions down, down beneath and murders one in a pretty rocking way. And oh, is it when he like steps on it. Yeah. 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 I always, I, I, I probably shouldn't have, but I always would feel bad for that one because it wasn't, <laughs> he steps on it trying to get out and, it doesn't the little demon doesn't just keel over and die he does like the twitch around on his back for a while and i'm just like oh poor poor little demon yeah it's it's kind of normal like i said this movie is really (laughs) mean-spirited and up to and including like yes you you are killing a villain but rather than feeling good about that you feel you know they're they are kind of adorable um and, yeah, I mean, I, that should have been the hottest toy of 87, right? It really should have been. <laughs> um, yeah, so after they, they finally get Terry out of, up out of the hole, and uh, he reads a little more from the Bible, and then it's just like, ah, fuck it, and just throws the Bible into the hole. And, and it explodes. You know, you know why that's kind of cool, though? Because that's also... Sorry, I didn't mean to... No, no, no. Go over there. Um I think that's also something kind of uh, novel about the childhood innocence, right? They they know enough to know, okay, the Bible is supposed to be this good divine book. So even though we don't really know what the hell we're doing with it, hey, this is what you do, you know, when you're when you're faced with evil, I guess, is go grab a Bible and it'll magically fix her. You know, just the idea of a, of a kid that isn't, you know, they don't seem well schooled in religion or anything, but it's just the general idea of that Bible is like the representation of all that is good. And yeah, I'll just throw it in the hole and that, that, that should take care of it. Like, you know, you chuckle at it now, but Hey, as a kid, Hey, it might not seem like such a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, (laughs) it's funny to me that it is such a childish kind of solution to the problem. But it kind of works, or at least it seems to, uh, because the hole kind of seals itself up and, and that kind of thing. And, uh, like, it, Glenn and Al seem to have sort of made amends with one another at this point. And even Terry is like, you know, I know I said earlier that I wouldn't want a sister, but maybe I would. You're all right, Al. And so the movie kind of lulls you into this moment where you think oh okay well they seem to have you know staved off the the forces of evil but that is uh, again because this movie is mean spirited as hell just an illusion because as soon as they go back into the house that night the wall breaks open and sure enough this construction worker that Terry made up uh, comes through the wall and at first looks dead, but uh, it, Terry cops to making all of this up. But nonetheless, this thing comes to life and pulls Terry into the wall, which seals up behind him. And so now Glenn's best friend is gone. Yeah, I think that sequence was great. And it's, it was very jarring because it I feel like this movie throws things at you that you don't really see coming now uh, you know now you could probably say okay him telling the story of that in the beginning should be enough foreshadowing but as a kid you know i didn't think anything of it until it actually happens but i thought the like the makeup job on the bed construction worker was excellent now how the hell did he die in the wall i i I had no idea how that would happen but hey it doesn't really matter it's still cool and even even just like the the concept of he goes back into the wall and the wall magically seals. I, I just thought that was cool. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it, it's the, this whole sequence is great because it's just one nightmare after another for, for Glenn. Um, cause now there are demonic symbols on the wall that are just bleeding freely. Um, when he runs upstairs to get his sister, Al, we see, the 
uh, the the construction worker in like in the mirror, uh, mm-hmm. which like busts out and tries to get her, and um, Al defends herself by using a stereo to throw at this dude's head. Oh, I remember those stereos. <laughs> and, and then maybe my favorite effect of the movie happens here, where after she brains this this construction worker with a stereo, he falls face first onto the floor and sort sort of explodes into these minions. That was that might be my favorite gag in the whole movie because it just like like I I I already said it, but for a movie like this for something for that kind of effect to pull it off and it, it looks so good it's just like whoever whoever worked on this movie to make that effect happen i hope they you know went on to a long awesome career because you know for a budgeted movie like this to, to make something that good looking bravo because yeah I, I love that sequence well yeah and it's a blend of the stop motion stuff and also force perspective and mm-hmm. it it looks like like you said it just looks amazing um the prosthetic makeups were done by Craig Reardon uh who did Dick Tracy he did Weird Science he did uh, 13 Ghosts, he did some Buffy the Vampire Slayer stuff, he did what else? What are, uh, Worked on American Werewolf in London, uh, did uh, uh, worked on Poltergeist, worked on Dreamscape, uh, wor- did, did the makeup for Sloth from the Goonies was, was him. So, <laughs> um, you know, the guy's got a storied career, has worked on some amazing stuff, yeah. but yeah, it's tremendous. Yeah, he has a pedigree. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a tremendous effect. And again, it, when I think of the gate, it's this, it's the minions in general, and it's this in particular, and how good an effect this is. Um, it's, oh, it's so good. So, anyway, they run downstairs to get a gun. And when it, Glenn opens up the gun bag, uh, out comes this like demonic rat version of Terry. <laughs> I was I was thinking about that too. I was like, I'm gonna call him Rat Terry. It looks like you had the same idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, he. You know what he kind of reminds me of? He reminds me of like the mid formation of Kid into Mouse from Witches. The Witches. Yeah. Like early nineties, you know. Yeah, for sure. That's what it made me think of. Yeah. <laughs> and he bites Glenn's hand. And then to to get rid of him, Al grabs her Barbie doll. And again, you know, from a writing point of view, it's like, oh, she is using a tool of her childhood to do something very unchildlike. But she <laughs> stabs uh, Glenn, or not Glenn, stabs Terry in the eye with this Barbie doll. And which forces him to retreat. But then out comes the construction worker who busts in uh, to this closet as well, grabs Al and does the same thing where he just kind of disappears into the wall again. And this is, uh, Glenn is completely alone now. He also kind of puts two and two together and realizes, oh, there were supposed to be two human sacrifices. And that would totally open the gate to make way for the real boss demon, you know, this old god. And yeah. and so that is done now, and he's all on his own. And because of something Terry said earlier about, like, the only thing that can destroy these things is a symbol of, of light and love. And so he remembers this rocket that he bought Al for her birthday that is under his bed. And so he runs upstairs as the floor and stairwell begin to collapse into this pit in the middle of the house. Yeah, that looked cool too. 
yeah, it's it's quite good. Uh, again, the effects work in this is certainly better than average, and sometimes genuinely jaw dropping. And he, oh yeah, for sure. He gets this rocket, uh, is trying to launch it, but the the matches that he's using to light it keep blowing out, and then out comes the the demon, which is partly stop motion, partly puppeted. The stop motion stuff looks not as good as the puppet stuff, if you ask me, but it it still looks pretty good. Yeah, and as he's... Well, two things on that. When he's rising out of the pit, it reminded me of the missile sequence in Weird Science, <laughs> when the missile's coming up. And uh, then I, I like the little cute uh, mini dwarf like worship dance. As you, as a, they're all kind of lined up around the hole in the house, and they go from like doing like a little dance to just kind of like shaking uncontrollably. Right, I, I found that kind of funny. Oh yeah, this is a big day in in the world of these demons, because you know the boss is loose. He is he is, he has he has risen. Uh, I think is is the uh, parlance for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and. Uh, so Glenn, of course, is hor horrified by this and thinks that the creature is going to kill him, but instead it just kind of pats him on the head. And yeah, I, that's it, it's very interesting once we get to this part because the thing is, uh, and I guess I, I would I would say credit to the movie that they're not really going for like. Satan, classic demon, you know, aesthetic or uh, story or anything like that. It's just kind of like these weird creature demons, I guess, with no affiliation to any anything known as far as I know of. And so when this thing comes out of the hole, it's just kind of like, I'm like, is he just looking for a friend? Or like, I don't know, because he just kind of stares at him for a little and pats him on the head. And I'm like, well, what? Uh, what exactly did you just want an invite to the party uh, maybe I, I don't know yeah i i always read this as it's the demon basically saying you're a good pet for having brought about the end of the world you know mm -hmm. that like i'm not gonna kill you and i'm not gonna harm you because i owe my the like i'm i'm basically giving you credit for bringing me back from whatever pit i was in yeah, and and also during the sequence, which I think it's happening at the same time, you would think like more to notice because outside it, it looks like Zool's coming back. Yeah, you know, we got the, we got like the streams of smoke in the sky, and it's definitely gone beyond just the confines of his house now. So I'm like, this is the part where you know I think nine one one would be getting called and uh, some back you know at least there'd be some alarming uh reaction from other people but no everyone's going about their evening you know watching their shows their stories on the tv i guess yeah I mean, right you would think yeah there would be like uh spinning uh police lights outside and you know people <laughs> running into the street screaming and whatnot but yeah and so the demon kind of pats glenn on the head is like, hey, thanks for getting me out of that pit, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll smell you later, and then disappears. And but he didn't leave without uh, a parting gift, and so he has left. Again, none of this is fully explained. It's just, this is my interpretation of it: is this kind of watchful eye in the palm of Glenn's hand, as if to say, like, well, this is I'm giving you. Uh, I'm gonna let you go, but I'm always kind of gonna have an eye on you. Yeah, and it felt like some type of almost like a, a prophecy because that's kind of matching the blood art on the wall, the, the eye next to the hand. So it's like, is that, you know, was it something foretold that like the bringer of the demon will receive the gift of the third eye in the hand? Like, I, it's, but I think that's the cool thing is like, you know, you brought up earlier the term Lovecraftian, and I think it fits because 
nothing's really explained, but at the same time, it doesn't really need to be. Right, yeah, I mean, because what's important is that Glenn now has caused the death of his sister, his best friend, uh, potentially his dog, brought about the end of the world, and is now completely alone. Like, it is all his fault. It is his responsibility. He is the one who is bearing the, the blame for this. And is, you know, it's it, it's sort of that, hey, I would rather I would rather die than live with this kind of thing. Where he's now forced, like, even the demon won't kill him. You know, he's just, uh, he he's sort of marked in that way. And, it, I mean... It's just horrifying for a child. The, the very idea of it. And this is why this movie is such a tremendous bummer. Is even though we get a little bit of uh, release at the end of this movie. The just depressing pit that this movie puts you in at this point. Uh, yeah, that, that's, gotta, that's gotta be, you know, hard on a kid. You know, I, I gave up my best friend... And my sister for you, demon king god. And you pat me on the head and you peace out too. Now I don't even have you. Right. I, mean, that's I just, really yeah. Awful. I just got to live with this. And yeah, it's uh, it's rough. And so he to get the demon to come back, Glenn stabs the eyeball in his hand, which makes the demon, you know, show back up and is like, hey, I just gave you that eye. You just. What are you doing? And uh, at this point, he uses a battery-powered rocket launch pad to fire this rocket, which uh, flies off the, the battery-operated pad into the demon's chest. And at first, it doesn't look like it has done anything and that the demon's just going to kill uh, poor Glenn. Um, but then the a white light appears in uh the demon's chest because he has been wounded mortally wounded with an object that represents glenn's love for his sister and uh he explodes and there is an hilarious shot as glenn is just catapulted out the front door of this place <laughs> Um, and I mean, it's clear that they had a young Steven Dorf on like a wire harness and just spun yes. him like the giant wheel from Price is Right. Well, yeah, I think the Demon King wanted to make sure that he didn't miss the fireworks show coming up. Right. Yes. <laughs> Which is totally what happens. Yeah. There's a big fireworks <laughs> display because the demon exploded in because of a rocket. And, uh, and then the dog and Terry and Al come out of the closet totally fine now. Yeah, we get the Nightmare on Elm Street ending. <laughs> well, yeah, except there's no... Nobody's getting pulled through the door at the end of this. It's just, hey, yeah. everything's okay now. And But here's the thing, Mike. The ending of this movie is so quick that you just don't have time, I feel, to register oh, everything's okay before the movie ends because you're still at that place of like, holy shit, this guy, this poor kid's got an eyeball in his hand. He he caused the death of his friend, his, his sister. He had to pull his dad's face off to keep from getting choked to death. <laughs> like, all of that is so heinous that the the kind of abrupt and optimistic ending of this movie just doesn't land for me it, well the only I, thing missing the only thing missing to wrap it all off is the parents car pulling into the driveway and then they look at each other and go uh oh and then they cut to credits yeah well I mean the last <laughs> couple of lines of the movie are like oh we're we gonna tell our parents about this you know um, and it's like eh, that's fine but it just the you know, the scales of lady horror justice here are tilted way too far towards the misery of this child for that ending to set things right as far as I'm concerned. But Yeah, that's a good point. Is it 
it feels like not only does it wrap up neatly, but the nature in which it does it, it's just like, oh, okay, everyone just kind of shows back up because it's, yeah, I, I, I totally get that. It's almost like, well, the demon's dead, so I guess we have no more movie. So I guess out comes everybody. Right, and everybody's okay at the end. Everybody, tip your waitress. We'll see you next time for the gate two. Mm -hmm. Um. All right, but so let's talk about performances real quick before we get into you know our our actual uh, scoring of this film. But um, and we kind of mentioned this earlier. Like this whole movie is on the back of a very young Stephen Dorff, who's really good in this. He's like really, I, I think he's very effective. I think he's very sympathetic. Um, you know, it, it's hard to play a kid who's kind of precocious, but you still are sympathetic towards him. And I think all of that is true. I think he's, I, you know, he's a good actor, was a good actor then, even as a kid, and has gone on to do some really interesting stuff. He was that last uh, True Detective season. He was amazing in that. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I think he's great. I think everybody else is like Terry uh, uh, Lewis Tripp uh, as Terry. I think he's totally fine i think krista denton is alice totally fine um and there and nobody else is in the movie long enough to you know kind of sink it or or uh lift it i don't think yeah i i think that's the main thing. the gate is nobody other than steven dorf is really giving you know has to do much to too or excuse me given too much heavy lifting to do it's very anchored by even when um, before, you know, he's isolated out, he's still given the majority to do Terry. They give him just enough to be like, kind of like the, the best friend that knows too many weird things and the older sister, typical older sister, but it's, but the weight of the movie is really on, um, Steven Dorf to portray, you know, that transitional age where, your older siblings pulling away because of the age gap and you kind of just you know you already feel somewhat lonely about that but then once everyone starts getting taken away and yeah he he does a really good job and everyone else kind of follows suit it's just that it's really his movie yeah yeah um all right so let's talk about like what this movie is about even though we've been uh kind of dancing around it or, or talking pretty explicitly about it really um, which is, this is just about, like, the the horrors of childhood and all those uh, sort of lingering fears that you have when you're a kid and you think everything is probably your fault, even though it's not. But this movie sort of poses the question, well, what if it, what if it was your fault? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, also don't throw dead things into holes in the backyard. Um, <laughs> Yeah, unexplainable that, holes with, with you know, smoke emitting out of them <laughs> you know it's about like being left alone and the fear surrounding that it's about you know to your point uh you know not explicitly just throwing dead dogs into holes but what if you do something wrong and then have to face the consequences of that and you yeah. know because this is a real like Terry and Glenn are gonna fuck around and find out kind of situation mm -hmm. and so this is a, like what if you're a kid and you fucked around how how bad could it be when you find out yeah if you step in it or you're forced to face it sometimes you're going to have to have to face it on your own I mean that's kind of a lesson in this one I guess yeah I just I really like that the movie goes as dark as it does. And I think I think that can be off-putting. I think it 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 has a vibe to it that is really really depressing and mm -hmm. really you know, not to just keep using synonyms for for dark, but it's just such a bleak movie by the end of it. That Yeah, it it's it's kind of that perfect uh balance because I think I mentioned at the very beginning before we even really got into the movie, it's bleak and then it has a on to it. But at the same time, there's nothing particularly about it that you would shy away from showing kids. Now, you know, obviously all kids are different, but you know, I remember as a kid, 
I, I, I was always struck by the tone of it more than anything. There was nothing like too gory that I found disgusting. Uh, the scares were there, but it was nothing like over, you know, overly scary that I, you know, would be frightened of. It just felt dark. Like it felt, it felt scary, even though it wasn't, you know, trying to throw things at me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think that. All right, uh, let, let's just get into kind of final thoughts and ratings here. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my final thoughts on this movie because you're, you're, kind of saying what I'm thinking anyway, which is, I think the biggest problem this movie has is that it never gives you any moments of brightness with Glenn. Really, like even from that opening scene you never there are the dream sequence it's always grim it's always oppressive i wish that there was almost a little more like of that spielbergian let's just let's just see this kid doing kid stuff for a minute <laughs> because uh, yeah like so, something like a silver bullet you know where yeah uh there's there's obviously terrible things going on but there are also scenes where he gets to exhale and just be a kid yeah there there really isn't that moment and so like uh, i was complaining about uh with the ending by the time you get to the end of this movie it's just been so continually oppressive in its tone that you would need 20 minutes of them just going on a picnic in the sunshine to kind of pull yourself out of the hole that this movie creates. And, and I think the other problem with the movie is another thing that we've already discussed, which is I don't know who the audience is for it outside of a very narrow kind of range. Uh, like I think as an adult, it's still interesting and it's interesting to, to think about, you know, how this movie is very much thematically about, what if everything you ever worried about as a kid came true in three days? But also that, you know, that as an intellectual exercise only goes so far. And, you know, I don't know if nostalgia blinds me to some degree because I do really enjoy this movie and I get a lot out of it. But I don't, if I came to it as an adult and I had never seen it before, I just don't know that I would think much of it other than as being kind of thematically interesting and having really good effects, you know? Yeah, so to me, when I look at a movie like this, I will always have a reason to recommend it to people. Mm -hmm. Part of it could be my own eyes of, you know, when I happen to have seen it. Uh, because I saw it as a kid in that era when it came out generally, it's a movie that will always stick with me. Um, but, you know, people do, you know, are just thoughts throughout the, the movie itself. There's plenty of stuff that I still enjoy about it. But if I was going to recommend it, like, you know, our age group uh, to people who haven't seen it, I would definitely have to quantify it by like, okay, well, here's, you know, some of the things to look out for how much you're going to like how much someone would actually rate it or how you know where they would would rank it i would be perfectly understandable why view it in the same light as i do mm -hmm. but but at the end of the day i still think it's a well put together you know movie that you know people always talk about gateway horror and i guess in this case no pun intended right <laughs> but for, uh, for sure yeah 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 this is something i think you can show you know the younger horror fan and it's going to get the job done without you know scarring them for the next few years right now tonally uh, yeah there it, it gets dark but uh at the end of the day you know sometimes that's what horror movies do you know? yeah yeah uh, I, I the thing i always wonder is like as you just don't it, like a movie like this would never be made today because mm -hmm. it it would be seen as too dark for its target audience and not dark enough for adults. You know what I mean? It, if this was made today, Terry would be like the quirky, funny, 
joke cracking kid. For not sure. the not, yeah, not that my best friend listens to satanic metal with incantations when you play it backwards, friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and and maybe maybe that was partially like satanic panic era part of it like oh that's what comes to mind when you want to do something evil yeah you know and that that's one of the things i respect most about the gate is that it 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 was made at a time where only only in that time could the gate have been made and right and so yeah it's it's fascinating on that level all right let's score this thing as always it's a one to five stars Half stars are allowed, no quarter stars because we are not monsters here. Uh, <laughs> where where do you land with the gate? So, um, yeah, I don't think I have to give a, a spiel before my rating because we really detailed out all of our thoughts for the most part. Um, I've, I, I'm still pretty favorable on this one. So I'm going to say four out of five. Like, And, you know... I'll, I'll quantify it again. Like, I understand why I would not rate it that high, but overall, you know, and I, I fully throw up my hand at the guilty party of being like, sometimes nostalgia can influence me. And I think when you hear the word nostalgia, sometimes I think that gets misplaced. It's not necessarily something you just merely watched when you were a kid. It's, for me, it has to be something you actually grew up with. Like, mm-hmm. the, it was part it was part of your dna as a kid where you watch it over and over you knew the whole thing and to me this is one of those movies so that could be a big part of what influences my you know high score to this day but uh yeah i I still think even if overall people wouldn't think of the movie overall as highly as i do i still think there's plenty to enjoy and appreciate and respect out of this production itself what what that got out of it for you know looking you know, like a lower manageable budget. So yeah, four out of five. All right, I'm I am almost there with you. I I'm gonna go three and a half uh, on this one, but I agree with everything you you said. I think it's uh it, it's a supremely weird and interesting movie, and it's to me it's like if Lucio Fulci ever decided he was gonna make a kids film, and this would be the result. Um, and, yep, and if they made him sign into the contract, no, like shotgun head head explosions. <laughs> yeah, right. Sorry, guy, not this time. Um. All right. Well, speaking of, let, let's get into uh, our final stop on this uh, this dark parade, if you will, uh, which is to talk about three bits of trivia uh, that you uh, probably do not know about the movie The Gate. Uh, one is that uh, the the kid who played Eric in the movie, the teenager who dumped the the dog body, um, it it was too heavy. This this dog body that they had. <coughs> Pardon me. So the set designer took the the dog that they had. Apparently, they had an actual like dead dog, uh, and he took it to a taxidermist to have all the organs taken out of it. Uh, to make it light enough for this kid to carry it and throw it into the pit. Well, uh, yeah, that's something I didn't know and probably didn't need to know. Oh. But uh, I guess I'm I'm glad to know it anyway. <laughs> yeah, nobody said that these were things you you needed to know about the movie. They're things you didn't know about the movie. <laughs> uh, yeah. Also, uh, the the patch on the back of uh, Terry's you know, blue jean vest, a.k.a. Canadian tuxedo, um, <laughs> is for a band called Venom. And they Venom had a song called The Seven Gates of Hell. And that is, in theory, the uh, sort of the inspiration for um, the whole idea of this band that's into, you know, the dark book. So, yeah. And I'll say on that trivia question, I'll take half credit because I do know that song, but I had no idea that uh, the movie somewhat took inspiration from it. And finally, Mike, uh, here is the uh, the scene that almost cost the gate its PG-13 rating uh, direct from the, uh, the director himself. <laughs> 
he said that the moment that they were going to, or that uh, Al stabs Terry in the eye with uh, the Barbie doll, that there is a much more gruesome version of that scene that had to be trimmed down <laughs> to avoid the R rating, which made a lot of sense. Yeah, I could see that because even with what we got, I mean, for this movie, it, it looked pretty gnarly. Yeah, yeah, it sure does. Uh, yeah, even for PG thirteen, yeah, uh, it, it's speaking. Speaking of that, what's the most modern release of it? Is it? Is there a Blu ray of this? There is. Uh, I don't have mine handy. I think it is Shout Factory is who put that out. Hang on, hang on two seconds, and I'll okay. uh, I'll tell you uh, who the distributor was. But yeah, there's a pretty good Blu-ray that's got some uh, special features, and it's got you know a, a relatively recent commentary that was done for this release. Um, so yeah, you can <laughs> you can find both the Gate and the Gate Two, should you want to, on Blu-ray. Uh, one of those, I would I would tell you, is even a good idea. Um, <laughs> it is, uh, is it Vestron? Uh, who put this out? Um, this is, let's see, got a couple of audio commentaries. Uh, it looks like it's, it's a Vestron Blu-ray, but that doesn't, I don't know that that makes sense. Um, yeah, Vestron Video is who's on the label though. So Vestron Video put out the Blu-ray. Um, and, uh, it came out in February of, uh, 2017 was when the, uh, the Blu-ray landed. So it, it's relatively recent. Um, but yeah, it's a great, a great transfer. It looks fantastic. It's best I've ever seen the movie look. So yeah, well done Vestron video. Um, yeah, I think the most current release I have is like whatever the DVD release was years ago. Mm. Yeah, uh, the the Shout Factory is uh, is Gate Two. Is Shout Factory did Gate Two? Um, kind of unsurprising, but I'm looking forward. Having just recently rewatched that, I'm looking forward to listening to the commentary on that one because it's the same director. So I just want to hear what he has to say for himself. Um, but we will we will be covering that movie next week, and uh, until then, Mike. Let's uh, let's wrap this up by giving people uh, an idea of where they can find you once more, and I'll shut up. All right. Well, um, a quick recap. Fresh Cuts is our weekly show. We cover new releases in horror. Um, the latest one that's out as of now, we just did that Shutter exclusive All the Moons. And then coming up, uh, the next one, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, whatever it is, sequel, requel, I think direct sequel to the original, whatever. Um, yeah, I, 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 will, I don't even know what to say about that one yet. I mean, like, I, I want to give everything a chance, so I'll, I'll just say that much for now. But uh, so, yeah, that uh, and then No More Room in Hell, the main show, the most current one out. On that one was my picks. We did Mad Love starring Peter Lorre from 1935 coupled with Body Parts with Jeff Fahey from 1991. I, maybe you can guess the theme on that one, but yeah. And uh, the next episode of that's actually recording this, uh, coming up Sunday. Venom's picks, he went with A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night and Thirst. Kind of like a vampire love February thing. Man, Thirst. Um, both, are, yeah. Bo both are good movies, but oh, Thirst, yes. holy crap, what a movie. Yeah, Thirst, uh, that's one of those upper tier, just amazing. Um, and both those can be found on Dark Discussions Network. And I think the one show I forgot to mention, it's more of kind of like when we can get around to it. I do with Gary Hill and Suzanne. Um, it's called Burning for Springwood. We have the fun task of tackling Freddy's Nightmares episodes. And uh, our next episode, whenever we decide to get together, I think next week, actually, we will be wrapping up the first season with the last two episodes of season one. So that that's the one show we like try to get people to join as guests, but we, per we totally understand why 
it's far and few between because it's talking about Freddy's Nightmares episodes. So, yeah. Um, but that's, yeah, pretty much other than, you know, I pop up every now and then on other people's shows. But uh, that does it for me. Excellent, man. Uh, thank you again for your inaugural visit. We will uh, we will do this again. Yeah, man. It was a great time. I'm uh, glad to finally join the parade. <laughs> that's what I like to hear. And so that is the conversation uh, with Mike Merriman. Uh, again, big thanks uh, to have him on the show. Uh, he was a delight. And be sure you check out No More Room in Hell uh, and all of the offshoot shows. Creature Comforts, like I said, I, I pop up on an episode of Creature Comforts talking about the movie Them, which is a terrific uh, sci-fi giant ant movie from the 50s uh, that is truly one of my happy places. If you've never seen Them... Uh, you should go check out that episode of uh, Creature Comforts and then check out the movie, or vice versa. It, both of them, I think, worth your time. Um, and uh, coming up on the Dark Parade, not only do we have more The Gate coming next week, uh, Gary Hill is going to be back to talk about The Gate 2, but we've got a new Heart of Horror coming. Uh, if you're listening to this on Wednesday, it will be dropping on Friday. Uh, and, man... Uh, we talk about Happy Death Day, and also there is a story uh, sent in by a listener at the end of that episode that is worth the price of admission, ladies and jelly spoons. But I hope you enjoy it. I know I enjoyed the hell out of listening to that story and, and was shocked, absolutely shocked by the end of it. So uh, enough teasing on that one. Uh, thanks, as always, for listening to the show. Thanks for sharing the show. Uh, if you could rate and review where that is possible, that certainly helps. Uh, the profile of, of this year program. Um, also, if you hop over to youtube.com forward slash Legion podcasts, you can leave a thumbs up on the video version of this podcast. And that also helps with some uh, visibility. So anything that you can do to help spread the word on the show, if you're enjoying it, uh, just means the, the absolute world to me. So um, thanks again for listening. Uh, we'll be back very soon with more next week. Gate two coming soon. Heart of horror with Kate Pollock talking about Happy Death Day and uh, One Night Stands, and you're going to enjoy that, I guarantee you. And as always, thank you for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you next time.